it, well, first of all, apologies for being late, but that's yes, what it what, is. What um, can you do? That's, yes. that's the way it is. Yeah. So hi guys welcome and to welcome to Simply Raw Interviews. Um, I'm Molly Lambert from Simply Raw Feeding and on the committee for the Raw Feeding Vet Society and have been for about eight years. Um, I'm also going to plug the conference here which go onto the RFVS website guys because it's going to be amazing and I think the first 15 people that want to join live in Barcelona can, can do that. So if you're interested in that, that would be amazing. Um, and welcome, Dr. Connor Brady. Thank you for joining us, Connor. Um, yes. You need no introduction. Um, I do. Owner of Dogs Go First, on. author of <laughs> the amazing book, Feeding Dogs, and one of the Raw Pet Medics dynamic trio. So welcome yes. and thank you for chatting and having oh. probably have a good bit of a rant, aren't yeah. we, about, about um, the problems with artificial supplements in pet food. A juicy um, topic. So, yeah, so Connor... Um, where do you think, where did these nutrient rules come from in pet food? Where did they yeah. start? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the origins of them is really important, actually. Uh, you know, who set these rules and, and what are they based on? It's it's always a good thing that uh, people ask, you know, when, when, when a figure comes out of the blue or these are normal values for this. Well, it's like, can I see what those normal values are based on? People are learning this for like, you know, these, we're having this problem with the uh, um, uh, raw fed dogs, how much protein is normal in the blood. And it's, well, if your comparatives are dogs fed very low protein, cereal based pet food, that's not a normal amount of protein in the blood, is it? Normal amount of protein would be normally dogs. So this, uh, who sets this thing? So in answer to your question, it's AFCO is, is the new kind of, AFCO is essentially a group of pet food manufacturers that, um, honed rules that were already in place created by the fda over in the us that people have heard of they had this group that they had to put in place called the nrc when loads of cats and dogs started dying going blind and dying particularly cats for lack of taurine in their diet they found out it actually was a lack of meat they stopped putting meat in pet food in the 70s they just thought too expensive who needs okay. it certainly not certainly not carnivores and so uh <laughs> exactly. they took it out and the cats started going blind and that's why we think cats today need taurine it's like well taurine is greek uh, for the bull isn't it so it comes from bulls and cattle and whatnot that's the best source of taurine uh, so they just need meat in their diet so the f the the fda in the states with the little subgroup nrc by the about the 80s they started running out of cash so they just said you know what it'd be easier if the pet food companies just manage this themselves and so afco was put together the american association of feed control officials which is a it's just a vampire's garden in the blood bank and so these guys took the rules that were in place and it wasn't a bad idea because they're trying to get pet food up off the floor so all the cats and dogs would stop dying complete raw dog food less than 10 cats and dogs put together have died but tens of thousands of cats and dogs can be killed by complete dry food and still be called safe but um so yeah. and it got it got the bad pet foods up off the floor but the problem was with these minimum criteria they use that's the minimum amount of protein you're allowed to use in the dry food 18 percent for an adult 22 percent for a pup not the ideal not the optimum so any vets that are recommending this minimum amount of protein who would want their kids growing up on the minimum why would you bother who's talking about minimums <laughs> but these guys are and they still are and it's the same approach 50 years later here we are in 2022 and we're still talking about the afco minimum nutrient guidelines and as we're going to get into how they came up with each one is is, is car crash tv it really it's is scary isn't it yeah so what about you know, should we start with something like calcium? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, look, look, I'm just gonna run with these questions, buddy. So, I mean, you're just gonna have to try and stop me with uh, when Ranting I get man. yeah, <laughs> when I get some because these are hot topics. Each one of these is a, is a is a thing, you know, but like, you if know, we run out of time, we can always do another one. There we go, okay, absolutely. You, you know where to find me, I'm always here, happy, happy to rant. Thanks. But uh, it's like, you know, fresh calcium, you just can't beat fresh calcium. And studies of the human um, supplement industry, particularly mineral supplements, vitamin supplements are okay. You can absorb them okay. But mineral supplements, the, the gut just does not like them. The gut doesn't like minerals full stop. It, even minerals found in nature. Minerals have to be holding the hand of a carbon molecule. It's called chelation. They have to be chelated to a, to a sugar, to a carbon molecule. And the gut sees the carbon molecule and goes, all right, buddy, come on in. And then he goes, oh, can I bring my friend a piece of calcium or zinc or iron or whatever? And in he goes, even though he wasn't invited to the party. And that's how your minerals get in. Now, when you 
get minerals from a conical flask, the George Jetson uh, nutrient pill. The problem is they don't chelate them to carbon because uh, that's mega expensive. You can buy these chelated mineral supplements, but they're hugely pricey, not used in pet food ever, very rarely. There is slightly better mineral supplements coming out, you know, but anyway, the stuff used in dry pet food is like zinc oxide and, and magnesium oxide, copper sulfate, you know, iron oxide, as it sounds, is rust. So studies of these conical flask minerals show that the absorption is terrible in humans. So even when studied, very large studies uh, looking at osteoporosis in middle-aged women, and uh, they show that people can eat five, ten times more calcium from their supplements and have worse and will have worse bone scores than people eating five, ten times less calcium, but from food sources, not just your dairy, but dark greens and everywhere else calcium comes from. So you can eat just a tiny bit of the natural stuff. That point is going to be repeated across the board with zinc and the rest of them. Just a tiny bit of the real stuff is wonderfully effective by the body. And the, uh, you need a heap of the bad stuff. And so they use a heap of the bad stuff in the belief that a little bit will get through. And sure, it doesn't matter about the rest of it. The body will just handle it. Come straight so out the other know, end. Come straight out the other end. Absolutely. A lot of it has to be processed away by the body if it gets through anyway. So um, the, the calcium carbonate thing is a big one. We know that that supplement is not great. So the idea of supplementing pup reproducing bitches with calcium supplements is a terrible dark art and you would really have to be holding the hands of a vet that knows exactly what they're talking about before you do that because if you let a reproducing bitch loose on calcium supplements and she eats her suddenly you see her and she's in the bag of calcium supplements you should rightly worry and get yourself down to the vet asap but if that dog's eating a meaty bone nobody panics that's a heap of calcium right there. And the pups don't come out like little statues or deformed because the body handles all that calcium very, very differently. So fresh natural calcium for your reproducing bitch. There you go. Have a meaty bone on the side, eat what you want. It's all That's really interesting. Fine. That's really yeah. interesting actually, Connor, because my little Jack Russell, she had puppies nine years ago. And in the last, gosh, I'd say about a month, she went off complete food and the only thing she would eat was lamb necks. So really high bone interesting. Contest. Yeah. And, and she produced four fantastic little puppies. But yeah, yeah. I've forgotten that actually. And, and that yeah, she just wouldn't touch anything else. She just wanted lamb necks. There you go. Yeah. Bones. Pure, yeah. pure um, zoo pharmacosy, oh, isn't it? Crazy, like, yeah. Uh, and and, yeah, and, body's, and body's probably women do it all. Better, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think we, we don't listen to our bodies as much anymore, but, you know, yeah. dogs, cats, cattle, deer, birds, insects, they're all known to do this at certain times. I mean, even with my, my last baby, my wife was eating a furious amount of apples, never really ate an apple before, doesn't care about them after, but really needed a lot of apples during this uh, last pregnancy. Who knows? There's something in there she, her body needed and she had a pure craving for it. But that's your, your gut flow. Or, and yeah. your gut screaming for it. Yeah. I, gut I feeling. Great, you know, Isn't it a great thing, gut, gut feeling. Yeah. Oh, yes. I do <laughs> like that. I have to use that more. That's obviously where it comes from. Yeah. You get this feeling. It's, it's a, people think, oh, I have a terrible sweet tooth. Like, well, you have a gut flora screaming for sugar because you've had a bit of an, a bad run of it, an unhealthy run of it, and you've just farmed a gut flora that just wants sugar. And then you give it sugar so it grows and then it asks it's later, get sugar. Yeah. Next thing you know, you're chasing kids down the street and robbing <laughs> their jellies, you know? So, but it's just, it's just a pure mechanical reaction to these little lives that we're trying to to farm inside us so yeah that's i love all that stuff that's really really interesting the zoo farmer cozy thing Marty, was so interesting do you know where uh, caroline ingram yeah absolutely the, the lady that coined it she's such a legend uh gotta get her on this actually yeah uh, I'll that's say a good it. idea actually yeah Oh, yeah. God, she's so interesting. So I was sitting down to dinner with her uh, the night before she was doing her show uh, where we were doing our, our, our conference. And um, I was just, you know, being skeptical and ask her about these things. And I want to put German chamomile in the dog's food if she has a dicky gut. And she's like, no, just leave it on the side of the bowl and let her select. Yeah. I'm like, no, let us get it into your dog. So we're battling over this. And the next day she calls me up. She says, I want four or five people that are very stressed. And and Connor Brady. So we all stand up the, the front. <laughs> oh, no, I was, I am very stressed. And uh, so we're stand up the front. She goes, This is licorice root powder. And she takes the lid off. She goes, Now everybody dip their finger in, of, uh, you know, pre COVID time. So you can all just suck your finger gleefully. And it comes along to each other. She goes, Now tell me what it tastes like. And I said, It tastes like, you know, shitty licorice. It doesn't taste like a licorice of all sorts. But uh, it's grand, you know, it's licorice. And she goes, Okay, grand. And then she comes back to them again. And as soon as the first girl who got her second dip tasted it, she went, Oh, that's sour. She goes, you can sit down, came back around to us. By the third time, I was like, oh, no, that's not nice. Gets you there, sat down. And by the last time, I think one of the guys went about six or seven times. And she goes, you need to go to the doctor. You you are seriously uh, wiped out. Your adrenal glands, you black eyes, wow. which is an adrenal gland uh, kind of sign. Apparently, now I know this is real TCM stuff that I'm very unfamiliar with. Uh, 
So wow. anyway, the point point was that's that's how zoo pharmacology and how yep. dogs and and insects and birds and cattle uh, will eat the legs of baby birds, deer, because they to grow these ferociously calcium, you know, these amazing so animals, yeah. and then just throw them off as yeah. if that, uh, I'll that grow them next year. <laughs> Unbelievable! That's how much calcium is in grass. So um. So, Funny yeah, enough, like, I, I did something similar yeah. with Isla. I didn't. I didn't realise actually that you had to try something seven times because Isla Fishburn came to stay with us years ago, and she she offered all of us and the dog spirulina, and I smelt it, smelt it, and went, oh no, really don't want it. <laughs> yeah. Darley loved it. Bongo, our little lurch at the time, he would eat the whole pot. And the terriers went, no, nah, not interested. So wow. it is fascinating. I, I don't do enough of it, but I'd love to learn yeah. more. Yeah, yeah. She said she often goes for spirulina, chlorella, all those kind of phyto phyto jobbies and puts them in the water so i like that idea and i also nicked an idea for her about the electrolyte water because as we started talking about that i thought well you can dissolve in good quality salt so if you're working your dogs or hunting or you know or if they're gut sick because your electrolytes control the osmotic potential of your gut so when you're pooing out you know water all the time your electrolytes oh. go to hell so you can offer your dog good quality filtered water anything but chlorinated tap water imagine having yeah a huge nose and drinking swimming pool every day disgusting uh, so that's why they want to get a mucky puddles and not your lovely fresh tap water you know so it's the crap that's in that they don't want so good filtered tap uh, filtered uh, water and in the second bowl good quality salt dissolved you know a little bit of hot Himalayan, water thrown into a second bowl. yeah anything yeah. anything cool with a name or you know good, good chunky salt not refined salt and the dog will take what you need so like if you're itchy you might take a bit of magnesium very popular to use magnesium in a dog on a dog uh, rubbing in the, the soaps and, and epsom salts all magnesium based ideas for itch but actually the dog might it might help the dog drinks it as well so you can pop it just from salt so uh, if we do if we do those farmer congress we're gonna have little bowls all around our kitchens going do you want some no yeah do you want some spirit yeah do you want some salt and you fall over them anyway it's we should stuff. do that's a great live because i want to see more of that when carolyn carolyn shows you the videos of dogs selecting you know you're stressed okay lavender or frankincense both oh. of them are used in stress yeah. so that she puts a drop in each tissue and puts them in different corners of the house which one does, suddenly the dog is sleeping out in the hall near the room with the frankincense on it and it's like oh it's frankincense for you buddy fantastic it's, isn't it ah oh, wow so oh that's really interesting i think it's she said it's repressed in us because it's we're such a our noses have gone to hell i mean we've lost nose, away with yeah. drugs and medicine haven't we we, we yeah we, i think seasonal eating we where is it you know we expect yeah. to get beans strawberries in yeah. December. they taste well. yeah yeah we demand them you go to the shop there's no bloody strawberries <laughs> what am i gonna have for christmas lunch you know how how uh, spoiled we are anyway uh, sorry i'm so diverse so we are listen so, this is get used to it this yeah, is, yeah. ranting man um, i'm a ranting yeah. girl too so what yeah, about what should we talk about next what about zinc iodine don't know what do you what's your what's yeah, your favorite the, next one i've got a few i think I, I think i think as long as if there was any vets or vet nurses listening but i think uh, the, the calcium the takeaway from calcium is that fresh calcium wins every single time and uh mm -hmm. the idea of of, take, of removing fresh bones from a, a meat and bone eating animal is is idiotic you know these are bone crunching teeth to these these ginormous carnasal tooth you see at the bottom the triple ridge thing and they side past each other so you know it's for chopping and chunking uh meat and bone so they need that sort of material so so yeah but yeah uh, after calcium i mean you could go on to you could go on to um zinc actually before i leave calcium one more point a lot of pet foods when they're tested such as by susan tixton in the great pet food test or pet food test results her website is uh, Truth About Pet Food. Oh, brilliant lady. Interesting woman. She sits in on all the AFCO meetings, the group I just mentioned, until they kicked her out, even though they're public meetings, because they didn't want <laughs> to be asked any make. questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, so she's a great lady. She puts her neck on the line. Uh, he was at the quite, Royal Feeding Vet Society in Bristol, uh, the yeah. um, last conference we did. Yeah, about amazing the lady about the tularemia talk do you remember that tularemia yeah. the bacteria from the factory that she thinks was laying out humans oh. and uh they, once she started exposing it they concrete it over the uh, factory that's so staggering, yeah that went that went to the very top that did very very dark yeah. dark stuff brave brave um, lady brave lady absolutely but the uh but she she tested 12 pet foods all the top brands and four or five of them were way too high in calcium and people would say why are they putting too much calcium in pet food well it's because the the meat that they used the meat meal they meat. call it or meat and, meat and bone meal is what most people call it. bone meal if you're a landscape gardener and um, so the bone meal that they put in because you don't send meat to a rendering plant you don't make money not taking the meat off the cow uh, so uh, the bone meal they use lots of the bone meal so uh, the calcium contents of their dry foods can be quite high so that's it is interesting that what and they most say people is think that's good won't they oh there's lots of calcium in my dog food that's great yeah that's oh great. that'd be great for his teeth yeah, yeah. not that sort of calcium and no. that's when you get this people obsessing over the 
calcium phosphorus ratio actually that's where we should go next phosphorus people are how much calcium how much phosphorus and the two are uniquely combined as if this crap is important for the kids like does anybody have kids out there does anybody know their rda of calcium how yeah. much calcium did you get kids yesterday haven't a clue oh you terrible parent you know your kids no are one enough. would would they that's what i say to every client no. do you know what exactly what's in your in your daily food of you know how much zinc magnesium i've got a clue so Not why clue. are we so stressed about it with dog food it's just because the manufacturer is telling you that that is yeah. you know it's marketing yeah it's, it's just crap it's, marketing. it's pure marketing i think it gives you solace that there's a you know trust the science the science is behind you so you, you feel calm when you pick up the bag of crackers with a cow's tone in it and, and are happy to pay six euro a kilo for it you know <laughs> twice the price of fresh chicken off the shelf at tesco's and it seems like great value too because it's perfectly done even though they don't measure the nutrient contents of the food going out of the factory as Hills just proved with their vitamin D scandal in 2016. That's my, that's my baby, actually, yeah. Oh, yeah, so we'll come back to that. Yeah. So the phosphorus thing, okay, so calcium and phosphorus, peas in a pod, uh, calcium and phosphorus, the two biggest minerals in bone. And uh, ne thanks to um, uh, Pete Coleshaw, uh, fantastic. Oh, lovely Pete. Vet. Yeah, Pete, so cool. Uh, and uh, he said to me at the, one of the RFES conferences years ago, he goes, yeah, and sure, you know, it's not natural phosphorus. It's the phosphates in dry food. And, uh, you know, you try to sound intelligent going, what? <laughs> and uh, then he goes, well, the, the, the phosphorus, the things that they add to the diet can be, is calcium phosphate. And phosphate is not the same as phosphorus, Phosph natural phosphorus. And so here's another mineral. And I said, well, tell me more, Pete. He goes, there's only two uh, studies ever done comparing natural phosphorus to the crap conical flask version that they use in pet food. Both of them done in cats, and both of them proved very, very clearly that phosphates are doing the damage to kidney function in cats, not phosphorus. I'll send you those two studies for anybody that's listening. Um, yeah, so you can I'm share like, them where you need to. Yeah. If anybody needs these studies, you can. Um, so, uh, so it's the phosphates in dry food and pet treats and stuff. So when they say you know um in early kidney disease we must we must drop the phosphorus and say well there's plenty of evidence there and we've got our karen there with a dog and and it, like we have plenty of evidence that natural phosphorus isn't too harsh on the old kidneys initially it's not something you need to stress about now if your blood readings and you should be monitoring this as you progress along to uh, as the kidneys get worse and worse if the blood readings start telling you the phosphorus is going up then you might start choosing lower phosphorus items but generally it's the phosphates that aggravate this condition and the calcium pot so again it's a whole conical flask obsession so if you are thinking you can george jets in your way through life you need to understand exactly how much of these are going in and how much you're absorbing because these are important things but not if you're eating it naturally you take what you need and through a natural process of osmosis if the if the blood the barrier needs it the brain barrier needs more of these nutrients it needs more dha it'll absorb more dha if it doesn't it won't you know because if it needs some phosphorus it'll take it if it doesn't you'll poo it out and that's the natural way of things as nutrients and minerals come in waves you don't get the same thing every single day in 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 nature so you're not going to get punished for eating a suddenly a huge amount of zinc because you ate a load of nuts you know so there's no there's no physical punishment for those things but it is if you're you say your body your body chucks it out your body deals with it that's so that's how in life you know you come across a salt lick you lick the hell out of it and you're done for four or five months you know yeah. it's crazy you know it's just and and, and you're not going to die you're not going to suffer a, a loss of a mineral you can live for months without vitamin c in your diet as the guy uh crandon who discovered that tested it on himself to prove it he went months with zero eating zero vitamin c foods and then one day he dropped it down onto the ground, surrounded by medical doctors, and they brought him back to life wow. by giving him vitamin C. And he proved you can live, and that's the most important vitamin. You need loads of that. And he lived for months without it. So the, the panic is that, oh, if I don't give enough manganese, his, his arse will fall off in a week. And it's just like, no, that's, that's not what you need to worry. It'd be nice if it was in his diet now and again, but it doesn't have to be every day. That's, that's ridiculous, you know. No, we like so, seasonal so. stuff. Like we're going to all be eating loads of black. Oh, yeah. They're great. Yeah. They're going crazy. So you binge on stuff like that and then you don't get any yeah. stuff all winter. So maybe that's when you're a bit fatter in the summer because you, yeah, I that's think exactly we've lost, it. I mean, I love eating seasonal stuff and, and I try and eat yeah. the dogs too. Um, yeah. Yeah. I like that point because I, I, I was thinking, you know, that's why sugar comes into the food chain. So you've got this, uh, you know, we're trying to avoid the whole cause of obesity is, is you're spiking your insulin. You bring forth more insulin and it packs the sugar into the fat stores and you get fat. So you need to avoid things that spike insulin, which is, 
you know, refined carbohydrates and sugar and all that kind of stuff. All right, we understand that. But then I was thinking, if you, you've you got these sweet berries and fruit in, mm. in coming into autumn that you eat lots of and it puts on fat because it's so perfectly placed because we're about to go through a winter when exactly. the sugar all food around. And it I, just, it's, isn't it so lovely the way everything works? It's so you know, logical, so, Connor. Yeah. You think about that and you, you look at my apples and everything's growing now and you go, that that's massive sugar. And it, yeah, uh, yeah but in the winter... Yeah. It's, but we don't live like that anymore. But I think I no, think lots of no. people are really going back. Certainly, we are here. We're going yeah. back to try to do. You know, I'm gonna get sick of courgettes in a couple of months' time. But then, <laughs> yeah, I haven't for another year. <laughs> yeah, are you growing courgettes as well? We've got courgettes. I've got a cucumber that big yesterday. Oh um, yeah. No, my pretty garden's rubbish, but we try. I don't have yeah. time. Yeah, I wouldn't have got a cucumbers. Who eats cucumbers? Cumbers, my oh, I God. Like what is the point? Then. Yeah, yummy. I just pollute them with salt to the point they are definitely not good for me by the time I eat them. <laughs> like beetroot and rhubarb, you either love it or oh, hate it. Beetroot, Marmite. no. Yeah. I know beetroot really? is good for you. I can tell by the colour of it, you're so good for me. I just can't get it into me. Well, maybe uh, maybe the same pharmacognosy thing says you don't need it. Maybe so. That, I, that's a good that makes me feel better. There you go. Horrible tasting vegetables. And celery. I'll go to a heap oh, of salt in Philadelphia. I like the crunch of it hanging out of a gin and tonic, of course. Bloody Mary. As I say, <laughs> bloody Mary. A few like. uses. Yeah, actually. There you go. Two perfect uses. So yeah, that was the casket frost. Another great one is uh, is zinc. Zinc is yeah. a really important, um, really important mineral. And up until actually 60s and 70s, people said it had no function in the body. So this is how little little we know about minerals and humans uh um but now you know we know zinc is fierce importance you know, if you're even just talking skin conditions you know a, a lack of zinc in the diet can be bad scruffy coats and dogs bit of dandruff those elbow calluses that you see pups and dogs getting you know you can have five or six dogs in a in a pen and only one or two of them are getting these elbow calluses you can actually rub almond oil or coconut seed oils on that and the zinc, selenium and vitamin e in that oil can actually bring back hair growth if yeah. it's causes zinc oxide so and the reason for that is because dry food is full of zinc but it's zinc oxide okay it's like it's just the worst type of zinc and we know dogs absorb 10 percent of the zinc oxide so you have to use lots of it so the problem is afco realizes this and so it tells manufacturers that the minimum amount of zinc is zinc in in pet food you must have is 120 milligrams per kilogram of dry food okay 120 milligrams so this is an insanely high amount of zinc for any food item to have even like when you pick out your nuts because they contain zinc they contain about that much zinc so almost all foods are deficient in zinc to afco okay so where does this become a problem <coughs> excuse me the problem is when raw dog food manufacturers and formulators like Noddy and myself are kind of you know build to to uh, to our task to create a, a a balanced raw dog food for a company and they say right we'll make this kind of balance to afco standards make them happy fediaf here in europe but fediaf just copy afco and then uh, so we have to run around and we make our mix and we think this is beautiful we'll add a few bits and pieces what a lovely meal and then we run it through this some sort of silly animal diet formulator which by the way guys you know <laughs> how can how can a how can an excel spreadsheet in the states tell me how much nutrients is in my blueberry or my grass-fed liver off a hill in wicklow you know it's it's just so how it is in scotland or yeah. Devon. Yeah. yeah yeah you know an intensively farmed piece of salmon versus so it's just it's it's just nonsense but um it, it helps but uh, look these are the things we have to use to keep uh, the departments happy and so we are raw to feed raw pet food creators look at our mixes then and we go oh shit we're deficient in zinc always deficient in zinc and it could be like you know three times too little zinc and it's like oh, i've really got the zinc got to get the zinc content up so you have to run around going oh i'll put in more pumpkin seeds and talk about how good it is for worms and stuff and it is but like you weren't intending to do that you were made to do that to get it to the minimum standards but we know that they don't need a tenth of that you know because we know natural zinc if i had a third of the zinc your crappy pet food has i've got buckets of zinc in mine it's you that's got the levels wrong so that's why we were right to start with the fco explanation because the the whole premise is is ridiculous and did you know that the um, maximums for zinc until 2007 were based on pigs. You could use 3,000 milligrams per kilogram of zinc oxide if you wanted to. Oh. And then in 2007, they said, yeah, this is this is based on pigs, so we're just not going to have any maximum for zinc. So pet food companies can and do use as much zinc as they like. It's, it's just like nothing. anything. It's marketing. It's get rid, of, <laughs> get rid of something you need to get rid of, like skin care. Yeah. You can have 1% lemon to call it lemon. 
It's yeah, just, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's that's always... why we like pulling it apart because you know it's wrong. If you, you know, an animal, that, that a dog that would eat a rabbit, you know, how, I wonder if anyone's actually analysed a whole rabbit, for instance. They you know, have. That's what they'd, have you? I haven't. They, I haven't. Yeah, yeah. Someone so has. I, yeah. It'd be really good to get that information one day and go, okay, how much, because obviously you've got your vitamin D in the fur and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But, that is what an animal, that is what a dog would naturally choose to eat there because it go. knows yeah. it's right or a squirrel or yeah. That anyway, was the, I'm, no, I'm that's, diverting that's again. No, no, that's exactly like this book uh, that I that I did. The whole first section of four sections. I had to set it up that like the first. This is what dogs eat. Let's look at the studies and the ancestry and digestive digestive morphology and you know track feral dogs and you know proper stomach analysis, all that stuff. Taste trials. You add it all up together. Go. This is probably what we think dogs eat. And you won't be surprised to hear it's a lot of meat, bit of bone, bit of organ, and bit of veg bit of fruit if you want you know why not who cares so you know quite very carnivorous right up there and uh and so that's what his diet is and so i just thought okay well let's look at his typical prey animals like you said rabbits rats mice birds lizards frogs few insects whatever all those little things anything with a face that's small that they can exploit so that's what they are so then i went and i found this cracking reference if anybody wants it by Deerenfeld. And Deerenfeld looked at the typical prey items of, uh, I'm not sure if it was a dog, but it was something that seemed to be like a dog because all the prey animals were there. It was like hare, rabbit. So she got like six or eight rabbits and put them in the blender and stewed them up and then al analyzed exactly how much zinc and phosphorus and calcium and all the other stuff is in it. So we could see, I just added it all up and said, well, this would be what kind of a raw dog food diet would look yeah. like. But yeah. try telling that to your dry food overlords, you know. Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, because someone's you know? saying that, yeah. Oh, it's just pants. Oh, pants. it's horrible. So, and and something interesting came out there talking about another nutrient, manganese. Um, so up until a couple of years ago, we didn't realize all of us making complete raw dog food and promoting it, is that complete raw dog food, a lot of them would be quite low in manganese because manganese it's a tiny bit in bones, tiny bit. It probably wouldn't be enough for the dog. It comes from hair and feather and hide and teeth and nails and all the roughage on the outside of the animal but the manufacturers don't put that stuff in there because if you've got a rabbit ear hanging out of it or a beak you go oh lads this is scaldy you know ming and pet food so we're trying to get manufacturers to start talking about this and include a few little mini feathers and stuff because that's the roughage we know from studies of zoo animals big cats in, in zoos that um gastrointestinal issues pop up in animals that don't get hide on their meat as well so we know hide is important and hair and stuff and that's where all the manganese is so actually, and manganese D, and vitamin D, you know, I guess, isn't it? Oh, oh, yeah. I think in skin, skin. because dogs can't oh, dog, dogs can't make vitamin D because they are hairy, but they Ooh. would get it from chicken that's been outside. Yeah, that, but but a barn reared chicken doesn't have any vitamin D in it. But I'm not. You get it from liver. Bit of vitamin yeah. D in liver, and, isn't that? and yeah. an animal that's lived outside, which I guess is oh, a rabbit. Cool. We're all, I think. I mean, it's something I think. Yeah, it makes perfect like. sense. I'm going to check it out. I just wrote vitamin D in skin question mark. I love it, Maddie. Very good. So, uh, so yeah. So then it's like, okay, what are the sources of manganese people can use in the meantime? Frozen mussels. What a great treat! You've got a unbelievable mussel industry in Scotland. It obliterated the Irish one. So you got these frozen mussels in Tesco's that have been partly cooked. They're always partly cooked, uh, you know, we cook them ourselves. But um, so partly cooked mussels, but I mean, it's great because you can just get a handful of these mussels, you know, people are coming over, your Dudley's going bananas, you know, spinning around trying to talk to you. It's like, Dudley, would you go out into the garden for a while and calm down? And he loves handful them. Of mussels. And he loves them and he's gone for, you know, 22 seconds, whatever it takes him to find every <laughs> single thing I threw out there. And, uh, but it's just wonderful food, high in omega-3, zinc, yeah. selenium, harder to find stuff. And your lovely manganese. So that, that's a great little treat in the cost you nothing. Three pounds for a 400 gram bag, nearly a pound of mussels that have been shucked for you and they're just ready to go. Beautiful. I wouldn't eat them. I don't. Neither do I. I can't eat shellfish. No. Oh. No. No. no, I like prawns. I like prawns, but most yeah. oysters. Who <laughs> eats oysters? Oh my God. I couldn't imagine. Oh no, it's just, there's too much. Someone paid me to once and I just didn't make it. I just, yeah, no. I, oh, I'm yeah, painfully no. allergic to shellfish, but love fish, but. Oh, yeah. actually allergic. Yeah, bad. It'll kill me. Ooh. Oh, okay. Okay, that is I'm dramatic. very careful. Yeah. But oh, okay. yeah, I want to give the dogs muscles because I don't, but because I don't like them myself, I tend to yeah. forget about that. Would you have a reaction but, if you touch the muscle? Or can you I actually touch them and throw them? Or do you have, I don't I just yeah. don't want to. It's just it's just you know, when you when your body I guess gut feeling again, it, when you know you shouldn't eat something, yeah, then I think your body tells you. Yeah, um yeah. and I've never ever liked the sort of 
crustaceans it's like ugh, yeah no. yeah i i have this with squid right i, I always say um like, you know, when you're trying to change over a dog that's been eating dry food for six, ten years, you know, cats particularly, they get very hooked on what they're eating and they don't really trust this new food. So I wouldn't start them off with a chicken breast because it must be quite a funny texture if you've never had it before. It's like, what the hell is this? You know, and uh, so I always say um, if you want to if you want them to eat calamari, don't show them the squid, you know. <laughs> so I would always start with something a bit easier, a little bit of cooked beef mince and slowly move to raw if you want with picky dogs or picky cats particularly, you know. But uh, squid always. Every time I say that, I think God, I hate squid. I just and there's something about the animal. And uh, this doesn't I'm look like it. something you want to put in your mouth, is it? Yeah, and I've got. A, I had a food allergy test before, and squid came up, and they said don't eat squid. And uh, shellfish isn't great, but prawns and shrimp have at it, and I do. I love. Prawns that's fine. That's, that's fascinating, isn't it? Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's weird, water. isn't it? So it wasn't all of them. But uh, anyway, what other minerals are cool? <laughs> um, what have I got? What about iodine? Iodine, there's another hot topic because I am obviously uh, obsessed with seaweed and all the benefits of that. You know, adding it into pet food is a great idea. It just covers a whole heap of Peace. vitamins and minerals and it's just fantastic. It's just so nutritious on every front. And that's like just talking about vitamins and minerals. But the really groovy thing with seaweeds is that they live in the most inhospitable region of the planet because they have to be one moment covered with water so there's no oxygen next minute they're in the sunlight so that's a complete shift and very few animals do that for for fun uh, and then they're bashed by rocks and then they're cold and then they're hot and then they're eaten so they are full of antioxidants and anti-inflammatories and they're full of compounds that don't exist above the waves so when we think of seaweed we think of like kelp you know it's just like come on there's ten thousand seaweeds under the sea that we've documented mm. so far more than than uh, herbs on the planet so like we have an unbelievable resource here that grows in a place that we don't grow stuff and grows like hell. Kelp mm. will grow it like, you know, half a foot a day in the right places. So it, it's a furious grower. And so it cre creates all this biomass. There's a fantastic guy in Scotland. Oh, I'm not going to get his name out, but I know his dog's called Dob because I helped him. And um, <laughs> I, he, we got talking about seaweed and he goes, and he just drops in that like, he's like the seaweed man in Scotland. I'm like, yeah, I know a few of them. And it's like, turns out he is the seaweed guy. And so he was about to get this big, huge, um, investment from scottish government and he was telling me about his idea but you can hear this so we've got this global warming issue and we're trying to sequester carbon somewhere and so we all think trees and now trees is going out we now realize growing trees waiting seven or eight years for this thing to be of certain size it's not as good as grass you know so cows eating grass that's a serious sequestering of, of carbon yeah. so oh. cows eat you know eating grass when it's relatively young they're dumping out 40 or 25 40 55 pounds, 55 pounds of manure every day, regrowing the soil as opposed to extracting from the soil. We're extracting. So we're adding to the soil. So that would be the way we're going to go, normal farming methods like that. But he says better than them all is seaweed. So he really? gets this He gets this little metal frame, 20 foot by 20 foot by 20 foot, with a little you know metal floated thing on it. And he drops ropes from it. You don't even have to seed the ropes. They just drop the ropes into the sea. They anchor the thing there in the intertidal zone. And they drop the ropes into the sea, and there's so much sea seeds in there, or seaweed seeds in there, that the the, uh, the kelp just adheres onto the rope and grows. And then they pull it up. And his idea is that he's got a little something like a little car crusher, a little blade and a car crusher, and the ropes are automatically hauled up. You don't even need somebody on it. He says, hauled up. They chop off all the seaweed, but they leave the stipe still on the seaweed. So it goes through, chops off all the seaweed, all the seaweed gathers, and then they compress it, and they squish all the water out, and they create this solid ton block. Of seaweed and they can do that every month or you know from like what about pollution in the sea is that is that not an issue the plan is what does he do with the carbon and he goes i just chuck it over the side and i'm like what and he goes well you've just taken that carbon from the atmosphere so you've just taken a cut you've just taken a ton of carbon out and it's like okay and what's the plan he goes just dump it over the side fish will eat it baby fish will live beside us all sorts of creatures live it you, you can put it at the bottom of cliffs to protect them from erosion uh who cares if it breaks up and goes into the sea it's food for fish but the main thing is you've taken it from what it was and you just extract the carbon dioxide because the sea pulls in a whole hell of a lot of carbon dioxide wow that's and so crazy. yeah so he's like and then he's like and even better he goes we've got all these closed oil refineries and oil wells here so you go so you just uh mix the the seaweed you mulch it up and you mix it with a probiotic and then you launch Bingo. it down to the, into the oil holes and it ferments and it produces gas and you suck off the methane and you sell it. 
I, I just I'm sitting there going, I don't, cannot believe this is an idea. And he goes, Yeah. So if you're flying to France and you know you're using half a ton of carbon dioxide, and you are each way, half a ton of carbon dioxide up into the air because getting your fat ass from Ireland to France and back. And uh, it's like, okay, I'll give Ryan Air a euro. And he goes, like, the real cost of that is like, you know, 50, 100 euro to this. There's a website, I can't remember the bloody name, where they actually do grow trees to compensate for your flights. But it's quite pricey. It's like, you know, pricey. What's the, what's the, what's the comparative? But, uh, you know, it's 150 quid. And he goes, you'll just go onto my website with seaweed and it'll just be done. It's like, click, you know, 20, 30 euro. And finally, he says, I can create, so he goes, seaweed, I can't remember the figure, but it's six, seven, eight times more nutritious than soy. And it grows in soil. It doesn't need any nutrients. It doesn't need any pesticides, nothing. And it grows. You can just fly a plane past the coast of Rwanda and just drop these things out. And they'll just have tons of highest quality protein hanging off them in a couple of months. And go help yourselves, lads. Wow. That's like, fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. So I love seaweed. Iodine is the thing, and we people get their knickers in a twist. And doesn't see we contain iodine? And he goes, "Yes, thank God it does, because our soils don't anymore." Yeah, so iodine is vital for your thyroid to function. If you don't have it in your diet, you're doomed. And we don't get enough iodine in our diet because we're not eating the right stuff. We're eating intensively weird crap. Blueberries grown in the same horrible soil, the same chemicals, yeah. given nitrogen every year. That's all they need. So you don't have these nutritious fruits. You have to eat seven times the amount of oranges you had to do in the seventies to get the nutrients out. So you know our fruit and veg are going to hell if you're not eating the stuff growing in the ground at your back garden type thing moddy stuff uh, oh, so no. well no, yeah. not enough of it but yeah i mean it's just it tastes yeah. different too it's got no chemicals in no it no doubt yeah don't have any it's like a it's like a delicious tomato that grows out, out of vine you taste and you smell and you go and your body wants it whereas you take out some of the tomatoes that comes from the supermarket and it's just like yeah you know, it looks like a tomato but after that it could be my kids it, tomatoes that yeah and, the, and i think it. strawberries are the best because in, in december they just taste completely there's yeah. nothing like picking yeah. a a fresh raspberry yeah. or strawberries. Yeah. Now. And I actually, some dogs pick those too. My, my guys don't yeah, like they do. fruit. Yeah, um, yeah. My dog, my fellow will take the blackberries, but very gingerly. He's He just sits there and waits for me to do it. And I do it for him. You know, like, <laughs> if I left him there, he'd do it. But I don't know. Bloody Cocker Spaniels. He just has the absolute workings of me. Um, but uh, yeah, so this iodine thing, I think a lot of people are worried. But look, some seaweeds are very high in iodine, like true kelp. That's laminaria. That's the stuff that grows in big forests that the seals swim through. That's not normally the stuff you get when people call it kelp because they call all seaweeds kelp. You're probably getting Ascophyllum or one of those brown uh, Fucus serratus, one of those things that grow pretty quick. And so these seaweeds aren't as high in iodine as, as laminar, but half the iodine content. So there's half the iodine gone. Uh, and then we look at the concern over iodine in pets or in humans is because those studies are of, go figure, conical flask iodide. Okay, so iodide on its own uh, particularly when it comes from a conical flask, in other words, not bound up in plant material, in fiber particularly, fiber slows down the digestion of these things. So when iodine is given on its own in a George Jetson pill, it goes into the blood, boom, and you've got a sudden shock of iodine, iodide in the blood, and that hammers a thyroid, and that can kick off issues in a dog or in a human. But never, ever, ever has it been shown that a dog has had needs this amount of natural iodine or not we have no idea i'll just like the other nutrients we discussed we have no idea how much of these nutrients dogs need we certainly don't know the optimum uh so particularly with iodine because it's based on these couple of iodide studies in the 50s and 60s it's like why were you giving them it's iodine different. in its own it blows the head off them it has to be tied up in food and when it is tied up in food groups like the japanese can eat many times their rda of iodine and be perfectly fine in fact you'd say they're much healthier these island people that are full of antioxidants and anti-inflammatories and fucoidins and fucoxanthin are benefiting from all the cool little compounds that seaweed has so in, in to conclude this rant on iodine i would say <laughs> the problem is if my if i had a hyperthyroid issue that's more cats you know you mm. little chew on your adrenal gland or whatever and so if I was hyperthyroid, you don't need more stimulation. So iodine's not going to help you, no. you know. But if you are hypothyroid, the dog issue, which is what a lot of dogs have, an autoimmune condition, you need something to get that going. And so we put in thyroxine and all the other things to, to stimulate, the, to, to replace the hormones that aren't produced. But you can help that thy thyroid by adding in some natural iodine into his diet. And because it's not iodized, in its bare form it doesn't give that kick and sudden shock that might bother your 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 struggling thyroid so natural iodine for a high thyroid dog in my opinion very very important mm. i'm waiting for a natural vet to disagree with that but we don't really have anything all we have 
have his iodide studies, which are less than helpful. They're confusing and scaring everybody. But seaweed, so, so beneficial. Get it in there. So many benefits. Absolutely. Would Dudley pick up seaweed on the beach where you are just by eating it or not really? Not really. No, he doesn't. I often post and ask that. Would your dogs do that, Molly? I don't know, because we, um, we don't take them to the beach that much, actually. We should do, but um, they're yappy type dogs. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, okay. No, I, I've never seen <laughs> right, them. Yeah. I've never seen them choose it, but it'd be yeah. interesting, wouldn't it? Some dogs, some dogs definitely do it because I post this once a year. You're down the beach and you get a nice picture of some. I laid out four or five seaweeds there recently. Name these seaweeds, get a free pack of whatever. And uh, so, <laughs> and and you always get, does anybody dogs, anybody's dog eat seaweed? And some dogs do. Some dogs eat ferocious amounts of it. And if your dog eats ferocious amounts of it, that can cause a problem. There's something to do with the algonates and the jelliness, jellification. The other way you use some carrageen and moss types of seaweed. For, for making your, your ice cream more jelly and firm. So a dog eating a furious amount of seaweed can actually cause mega gastro issues. So tiny bits of zoo pharmacosy going on, bits of, you know, taking a bit of that and this, have at it as I'd let him eat grass and whatever else he wants to eat. He knows what he's doing. But large amounts of seaweed, as somebody pointed out to me, I wasn't aware, uh, they said, don't let your dogs eat like the whole bloody stipe. I was thinking a great hard treat for a dog would be grab all those free stipes on the beach and dry them out and cre <laughs> create this hard little stick. And so on. that's said, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> oh, Connor. I said, oh, I'm not going to bring that one out. But, uh, I'll have yeah, to pick so, some next time we're at the beach and see what happens. So easy. Stay away from the marina. Stay away from the ports. Mm -hmm. Go somewhere clean. Don't take the stuff off the beach. So you dry it out crap. And uh, go go somewhere with those rocks. Wait that's a couple of comments are actually saying, so Fiona's saying her dog eats seaweed off the beach, especially if they're dead crabs, and it's lovely. Ooh, tasty, Rachel lovely, Mine. very. Yeah, so some do yeah. then. I just, um, I just That's interesting. haven't experienced that. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that you take the sea to you cut the seaweed, you leave the stipe on the rock, you know, and you cut the seaweed, you can get brown seaweeds, red seaweeds, like dulse is the red seaweed that Ireland, Britons are very fond of, Scandinavians, but a lot of it comes from Ireland. Just unbelievably nutrient-dense, but dulse, the red seaweed, also contains, and kinic acid and kinic acid outperformed many of the chemical warmers we use in, in cattle and sheep today kinic so ki kinic acid k-i-n-i-c yes. ki kinic acid yes. and it's high in dulse the problem is everybody likes dulse because it's one of the sweeter seaweeds but uh so that's the that's the kind of seaweed you promote for for anti-worming so what do you get in seaweed. the chinese takeaway when you get fried seaweed what's that then uh, wakami and a few others yeah they're different and they do come from japan we don't grow we have a few of those types they're kind of flat leaved you know but they have a very particular type that they use for that but uh i'm not too sure if the, you grow much of it from Ireland. i've never seen i've never been offered it i've always liked to have a we use 16 17 different things one of them is a there's this product for weepy eyes um it's a a potent anti-inflammatory of mucosal membranes. I had no idea about this, by the way. There's a seaweed scientist with 30 years experience that I just nick his ideas. I say nick, he's happy to talk. He's at the end of his career and he's like, do you know what else we use in cattle to, to increase bulk? This is what we use in chickens to reduce the amount of antibiotic use. Like he's just throwing these things out, always seaweed-based items. Uh, you know, so, and he goes, this one, mucosal membranes, it's unbelievable. And it's a tiny little red moss and it's all ground up like that. And he goes, the problem is it's a devil to pick. So you have to wait very certain parts of the shore. The tide goes out and people have to run out. Right. They have to pick this tiny seaweed and then pick all the stones and possibly plastic out of the seaweed by hand because there's no other way to do it before you dry it. If you dry it, it curls up on itself. And that's it's really the, expensive. Yeah, so it's mad expensive, but it's, it's, it's really, really effective as an anti-inflammatory. But you don't get this. Like, I mean, even the, I have a, an article there if people want to read it on study uh, on, on dogsfirst.ie kelp for cancer you should see the review studies and a review study is a review of the literature that exists this isn't just one or two you know hillbillies cre cre creating this kind of quaint little study this is the thousands of people many years huge amounts of experience and the kelp for cancer one is a review is a review study of, of, of various series for cancer and it's like anti-tumor anti-proliferative anti-cancer anti-anti-anti and like a list of seaweeds beside it, a list of the studies beside it. Unbelievably effective. Tell me why you wouldn't take that if you were suffering cancer or going through chemotherapy. Why wouldn't you just take it on the side? Why wouldn't hospitals recommend that? Why wouldn't they serve it to you? Do you uh, know? Go and get me on another one. Yeah, what? Are you going to visit someone, someone hospital? Someone we were talking about the other day. What are you, what are you offered for food? You're offered chocolate oh, bars, yeah. Coca-Cola and crisps. Just go, oh, we're trying to yeah. make you better. Anyway, that's a completely mm. different um, rant. But anyway... <laughs> So in fact, imagine giving imagine giving anybody with cancer carbohydrates. Full stop. Exactly. You don't get jelly and ice cream from us. Okay, you can Kill put it into yourself. Yeah.
but like they're the messages you should be sent home with and instead people that do understand the nutrition when they go into hospital they're kind of talking to the hospital nutritionist going you're giving me what yeah. you know uh, as you know I experienced recently with a friend that went through it it's kind of like the hospital nutritionist was really not prepared it's like oh okay. eat whatever you want eat whatever you want during chemo and it's like eat whatever i want during chemo i think a great tip came from this lady yeah. I know who you're talking about. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolute legend. But yeah. um doing good now. So um thankfully. So blueberries, right? So you know the way sometimes as Marty was just saying there, when you buy blueberry base and you go, oh, it looks like a blueberry, and you eat it and he goes, This is very disappointing. You know, it doesn't it's it's just it's just soft. It's a, okay. Yeah. So you, you know it's crap, okay? And it's but that's what you get for buying blueberries in December. Okay, that's I fall for that. And then you try buy organic blueberries and you kid yourself into thinking they're they're ever so slightly better, and they probably are. They certainly have less chemicals in them. I mean, the fact that our top foods like grapes and blueberries and strawberries are in the dirty dozen, you know, don't mm-hmm. eat the because they don't have skin to protect you from the chemicals it's like what this is our food chain it's crazy potatoes yeah. just made it onto it um so uh anyway the best blueberries oh this is such a good tip um if i say so myself uh is is um these blueberries come from scandinavia and lithuania right so they've got forests wild forests and people go out and they just shake the tree and blueberries fall off it. and when they're wild they're okay. called bilberries and then they get these wild bilberries that have grown in these luxurious, beautiful, unchemical soils. They dry them out, desiccate them properly, cryogenically. And so you get this blueberry powder, which you get it. The brand I buy, for any I'm not associated with them, it's called Louvre, L O O V. But there's ma- many different brands. I'm sure it's all coming out of the same few people that do it. But uh, Scandinavia, Lithuania is where they come from. And so you get these, Americans get it from Canada, I think. So you get these wild bilberries, you get this powder. And, you know, because 95% of the water has been removed, when you compare the price, you look at the 100 gram bag and go, oh, that's pricey. But actually, when you look at your blueberries and your tiny little plastic tub flown from Egypt, but it's like, great, this, it's, yeah, this is what you have to buy thousands of those tubs or hundreds of those tubs to compare yeah, to this, this. yeah and it like it stains your skin and no matter if you put even a tiny bit into your smoothies everything turns purple you can't put it into put it into the dog's food it's just a purple dinner but we'll call it unicorn food because my kid loves unicorns <laughs> and so everything turns your buns try to put purple purple buns unicorn they're like turmeric <laughs> yeah they're like turmeric you just can't but the when you taste it i can't help but say it's a bit disappointing you go oh god it tastes like it's good for you it tastes it tastes supercharged. It tastes like eating a battery nearly. But the, <laughs> the 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 bioactive compounds in those wild berries are unreal. It's like a it's like a dwarf graph of anthocyanins and all the other cool resveratrol and all the compounds you're trying to get from that blueberry. So wow. it's the same price, but bang for your buck is unbelievable. Mm. So I don't mind a bit of desiccated stuff to hit. No, those needed, no, you know, no. cool. Absolutely. But uh, what's this about vitamin D? You're going to say what's going on there? Vitamin D, oh, yeah. no, I just I just um, talk about vitamin D quite a lot because a lot of people feed their dogs chicken. Now, if you feed your dog chicken and it comes from the barn-reared chicken, that animal, that bird's never been outside, therefore it's completely defunct in vitamin D. Because yeah. although they are, they, are a, they are allowed to have access to the outside, we all know that barn-reared chickens don't. It's got to be organic. No. It's got to be living around outside, getting being in the sunshine. So I think I find a lot of dogs are really deficient in vitamin D because of barn reared chicken. It's got to be outside. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess else... that's the same with beef. That you know, a lot of animals are reared in barns nowadays. Yeah. Look at your average cow lives in a barn. It's fed yeah. a high sugar diet of silage and given antibiotics just in case it gets sick. Um, yeah. And we have a lot of really sad. We have a lot of chicken sheds in Devon, and I hate them. Um, yeah. It's it's awful. But that's what people want chicken. Again, in the seventies and eighties, we didn't get it. It's just now such a an easy yeah. to get hold of food, and and obviously it's gone into the dog food, which is great. But I yeah. think if you just fed your dog um, chicken, and it was barn reared, you'd have an issue. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. There's, it's got to be nutrient defunct and a whole heap of things. Your omega threes and all yeah. the kind of groovy stuff that we know cattle is like you know a huge amount more omega three in outdoor grass fed cattle and lamb and. That yeah. kind of stuff, but even disease and just general health and vitality has got to be completely different. And then remember Nick saying there on Tuesday, big difference between grass fed and pasture oh. fed. Pasture fed is all different plants grown in the but pasture fed is grass or grass yeah. fed is grass, whereas pasture fed is a whole heap of plants. And I'm like, oh, see, so it, oh, it could be hay, it could be yeah. anything, yeah. and, and yeah. actually, grass a grass fed animal like our sheep 
they nibble around in the hedges. They don't just get grass. They, yeah, they choose yeah. what they want. It's fascinating. Yeah. Lovely, it's very, yeah. Yeah, and there's not enough people talking about that because, you know, sadly, the UK and soon Ireland, because, you know, we've certainly got it in Northern Ireland here anyway, uh, mega farms. And so mm-hmm. we we weep for the fact that more than 90% of the beef in the US comes from disgusting CAFOs, uh, you know, horrible, insanely cruel and nutrient deprived. Mm-hmm. And that's where your super bugs are coming from. And it's all still going on because people want burgers for 20p, you know. Exactly. Oh, and, uh, we have to we have to take the responsibility and say, do you know what? We might have to move back to lamb on Sunday, and you yeah. might get a bit and then of have it as a leftover once. Sorry a Sorry about you. That's there kind you of go. what we do yeah. here now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You get we a chicken do. and you get a couple of meals out of it, two or three meals out of it. I mean, you can't help but get a couple of meals. Who eats a whole chicken? You know, it doesn't matter how many people. You've always got bits left over and getting into stock and broth. There's a great another nutrient conversation making. Oh, bone broth. Bones. Yeah, from good quality yeah. chicken bones. Why would you stew a Sometimes I put for... mine, I've got an Argus, so I've got a slow oven. So sometimes I put, the, if I don't want stock, I put the whole thing in the, in the bottom of the Argus for about three days. And the bones That's are so right. soft, you squidge them. And that goes into the dog food from time to time. Because it's cooked bone, no but it's way. so soft. It's literally like you squidge them in your fingers. Oh, my God, that's so cool. So it just sits in the bottom of your bag. You don't have to think about it in a little drawer. Yeah. No, you so, might forget yeah. it. it. Might go a bit black after about a week, but um... <laughs> yeah, ups and daisies. House reeking the chicken for the last week. <laughs> yeah, my mum had an aga. She every couple of weeks she brings up the fact that we told her to get rid of it. And in oh, the, I love it. Late eighties, it wasn't cool. It was my grandmother's aga, and then mum had it. I always remember we grew up in a roasting hot kitchen, big kitchen comes there, uh, eating area, and it was always roasting hot the aga. And then nineteen ninety one, like it was the last time I saw the aga was gone, and every week she she weeps for this loss. She got a cooker, and she hates the cooker. Mm. Mine's nearly 60 and I love it. It's, it's, wow. it's never going to break. It's just great. Yeah. It, yeah. You know, it's, I, if I'm late because everyone boils the kettle, then that's tough. I don't have any other <laughs> yeah. cooking. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. You can have a glass of wine while you're waiting. You know, I've got a sneaky one for afterwards here. <laughs> oh, perfect. Ready to go. Lovely. Um, yeah. So, so that's kind of, I think the, the, uh, there's other things like, you know, the whole vitamins and that kind of stuff. But like, I think dogs are kind of, I think they're kind of okay on the vitamin front. I can't see the mad deficiencies. Brand's a big one for the vitamin C thing, which I had to kind of look up and make sure I was right. And he was saying the problem is the temptation is they use ascorbic acid all the time. And ascorbic acid isn't well absorbed by dogs, has a few little side effects uh, that you don't really want. So it's not incredibly bioavailable, but it's the stuff you get in pet food. You want, I have to write it down so I wouldn't forget, mineral ascorbates. So, you know, I had done like maybe five or six pages on vitamin C and this, this wasn't what I was talking about. It was how much and how little is being used in the side effects in dogs. So this mineral ascorbates thing is, is a good idea. But this, it, these for raw feeders and for fresh feeders, these are details we don't need to know because yeah. we are already feeding the foods that contain these. Exactly. So, yeah. So the, all the chat today, as much as enjoyable as it is to 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 take the piss out of dry food and you know and the industry like and the yeah it just doesn't apply to us we don't have to worry about any of those things so it's it's a it should give people a, uh, a bit of um a bit know, of peace of mind that, that peace of mind yeah decent raw yeah. food if it can't be the most expensive it's not organic it's still a yeah. hell of a lot better than feeding a the dry yeah. happy kibble isn't it yeah yeah it's called and you stick in your organic wild blueberries you stick in a wild fish now and again little oily fish yeah. bit, of, bit of seaweed i mean you're doing better for the dog than you're doing for yourself you know Just remember they had scraps off our plates yeah you know, and then they yeah. look pretty good on it yeah exactly you know calm little dogs roaming around and mm. learning how to talk to their dogs Probably had an insane over dog overpopulation problem and whatnot, but poo on the streets, but they were happy, god damn it. They were but, happy days. Uh, hey, well, listen, Colin, I mustn't yeah. keep you because I know you've got probably small people to go and um, put to bed or whatever. Yes, I do. I must, um, I must go attend to it. But one, one more kids. plug for RFES. Yeah, so anyone who wants to come to our amazing conference, which we're all going to in Barcelona, um, Can't wait. have a look on the Raw Feeding Vet Society um, platform and... I think, yeah, the first 15, I think Laura was saying, um, can come in person. Anyway, I probably have got some of that information wrong, but I apologise in advance if I have. And if there's lots of chat there, I, we, I will, we'll obviously do our best to, um, to answer it. But thank you, Connor, for um, yeah. a good chat, as usual. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So don't hey, be Well, maybe we can do another one if I, if I can persuade you to do another Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know where to find me. Absolutely. In the future. Yeah. Caroline Ingram is the next one. Uh, I'll send her off. Yeah, I've made a note of that. I've got, yeah, I've got lots yeah. of ideas. And, um, yeah, it's sure, her story about um, 
she's got a story about where some elephant, some rare elephant, fell into a well and picked up a bacterial disease that kills elephants and nobody's ever been able to cure it in an elephant before. They're hard to dose with anything because they need so much stuff. Rhinos and elephants, they're not ones you want to treat for bacterial diseases, apparently. Uh, you don't just give them antibiotics. So, uh, and you can't get stuff into their skin. And I thought, oh yeah, because their skin's so thick. It's not, yeah, it's just like, you're not going to find a vein on an elephant. So I was like, oh my God, right, it has to go in various places. So um, so she her, her story about saving this elephant garlic and then the elephant says yeah i want garlic i need garlic it's antibacterial and she goes i need more garlic and they said what <laughs> it's like we don't know what garlic is we don't have garlic so they had to run around looking for garlic in this place and so she got to the point where she's running around saving animals there's a grill in need there's this there's that and she goes i just have an idea what they need and offer them five or ten things it's not rocket science and then if they yeah. have it you just better hope you've got enough of it and the animal can fix himself, you know? That's incredible, yeah. isn't it? I love it. I oh, love that. It wow. makes so much sense to me. Yeah, so interesting. And she marries it with the TCM. Eastern medicine, they just have everything right. Every, we're coming back to everything they said is correct. From herbology to acupuncture, meditation, although we've we kind of made that very Western. But all that, all that stuff was theirs many, 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 many years ago, you know, like bloody hell. And, they just and lost the way with it. We went off on one. Academia is the answer. No, that is messing us up big time because it's been hijacked. And now academia, you know, is 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 troubling me. Yeah, but that's a hot, actually. There's the next thing we should talk about: dirty science. <laughs> we're never gonna have it. We're never gonna run out of stuff to do, are we? No, no, Brilliant. no. It's great. It's, I love it. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, buddy, thanks for having me on. No, not at all. It's a pleasure, Connor. Thank you, and yeah, um, We will see you soon. Talk to you soon. Cheers, Marty. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. I don't know how to press it.